David Crosby, folk rock voice of the 1960s whose influence spanned decades dies at 81. He was an original member of The Birds and a founder of Crosby, Stills & Nash, but he was almost as well known for his troubled personal life as for his music. David Crosby, the outspoken and often troubled singer, songwriter and guitarist who helped create two of the most influential and beloved American bands of the classic rock era of the 1960s and 70s, The Birds and Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young has died. He was 81. Patricia Dance, a sister of Mr. Crosby's wife, Jan Dance, said in a text message on Thursday evening that Mr. Crosby died last night. She provided no other details. Mr. Crosby was inducted twice into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as a founding member of The Birds and as a founder of CSNNY. He brought jazz influences to both groups, in the process broadening the possibilities of vocally driven folk rock and his reach extended to later generations. His alternate tunings became an inspiration for the innovative freak folk movement of the early 21st century while influencing scores of other musicians eager to give acoustic music a progressive spin. If Mr. Crosby's music expanded boundaries, his persona fixed him in a specific area, and proudly so. In 1968, he wrote Triad, an ode to free love, recorded in distinct versions by the Birds, Jefferson Airplane, and Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. His song, Almost Cut My Hair, which he recorded with CSNNY for their acclaimed 1970 album Deja Vu, was a virtual loyalty oath to the counterculture. Mr. Crosby's image as the twinkle-eyed stoner and sardonic hedonist of the cosmic age was said to have been a model for the obstinate free spirit played by Dennis Hopper in the 1969 movie Easy Rider. His impish indulgencies turned potentially lethal many times. He became nearly as well known for his drug offenses, weapons charges, and prison stints as for his music. By the mid-1970s, he was addicted to both cocaine and heroin. You don't sit down and say, gee, I think I'll become a junkie, Mr. Crosby told People magazine in 1990. When I started out doing drugs, it was marijuana and psychedelics, but it was fun. It was the 60s, and we thought we were expanding our consciousnesses. But later, he continued, drugs became more for blurring pain, he added. You don't realize you're getting as strung out as you are, and I had the money to get more and more addicted. Mr. Crosby's drug abuse may have exasperated his medical problems, including a long battle with hepatitis C, which necessitated a liver transplant in 1994. He also suffered from type 2 diabetes and in 2014 had to cancel a tour to endure a cardiac catheterization and angiogram. Despite his health issues, his voice remained robust enough in those years for him to tour. And in his best moments while performing with Stephen Stills and Graham Nash, he could recreate some of the most famous harmonies of the rock era. His voice remained strong as well when touring with a solo band in later years. A prominent lineage. David Van Cortland Crosby was born on August 14, 1941 in Los Angeles into families with deep roots in American history dating back to Dutch rule in New York in the 17th century. His mother, who was born Aleph Van Cortland Whitehead, descended from the prominent Von Cortland family. His father, Floyd Crosby, an Academy Award-winning cinematographer whose credits included the classic western High Noon, was a member of the Van Rensselaer clan. David attended Crane Country Day School in Montecito, California, where he starred in the Gilbert and Sullivan Opretta, HMS Pinafore, and other musical productions, but he flunked out. He completed his high school studies by correspondence at the Cate School in nearby Carpentaria. He studied drama at Santa Barbara City College, but he dropped out before graduating to pursue a music career. He was 16 when he received his first guitar from his older brother, Ethan, who had begun playing years earlier. David started out, like so many others in the early 60s, performing folk music. I would learn two chords and go back and forth between them, Mr. Crosby told the British music magazine Mojo. What took it to the next level was, my brother started listening to 1950s jazz, Chet Baker, Dave Brudbeck, people like that. Listening to jazz really widens your world. Mr. Crosby also absorbed the music of the Everly Brothers, which taught him how to layer harmonies into diaphanous patterns. 
He first performed with his brother, but he soon went solo and drifted through coffee houses around the country until landing in New York in the epicenter of the 1960s folk movement Greenwich Village. In 1963, he cut his first demos produced by Jim Dixon, who would later manage the birds. Mr. Crosby, who briefly played with the folk group Les Baxter's Ballad Deers in Los Angeles, got to know Jim McGuean, who later changed his name to Roger, and Gene Clark while they were performing as a duo at the Troubadour. He soon began adding his harmonies to theirs on stage, fitting in so smoothly that they became a trio known as the Jet Set. Mr. Crosby brought in Mr. Dixon to become the group's manager. Mr. Dixon encouraged them to advance the new sound they'd already been exploring, which combined their earlier folk influences with the electrified sound of the British invasion bands, particularly the Beatles. To that end, the band added a drummer, the inexperienced but handsome Michael Clark, and Mr. Crosby took up the electric guitar. Together, the revolutionary style they honed became known as folk rock. That hybrid found its first recorded expression after Mr. Dixon acquired an acetate of a new Bob Dylan song, Mr. Tambourine Man, in August 1964. The band's own demo of the piece with the new recruit Chris Hillman on bass helped land them a contract with Columbia Records that November. Two weeks later, the Jet Set changed its name to The Birds. Writing Songs and Hits Columbia, however, felt that the group hadn't yet gelled musically, so only Mr. McGuean was allowed to play an instrument on the single, which came out in April 1965 with studio musicians accompanying him. Mr. Crosby and Mr. Clark did provide impeccable harmonies on the song, which helped it reach number one on the Billboard Singles chart. The song was the title track of their debut album released in June 1965, and the full band played on the rest of the tracks. Mr. Crosby didn't contribute compositions to the Birds' first two albums, but on their third, Fifth Dimension, 1966, he and Mr. Hillman helped fill a writing void left by the departure of the band's most prolific songwriter, Mr. Clark. Mr. Crosby contributed to the composition of several songs on the album and wrote one himself, What's Happening? Its lyric introduced a Crosby-esque motive, posing questions that had no answer. More famously, Mr. Crosby wrote the band's smash hit, Eight Miles High, with Mr. McGuean and Mr. Clark. For The Bird's next album, Younger Than Yesterday, Mr. Crosby contributed Everybody's Been Burned, which idealized the key strategy of his emerging style to contrast a dreamy melody with dazed lyrics. A more daring number helped seal Mr. Crosby's fate with the band. He'd written Try It for the fifth Birds album and the band recorded it. But the other members were reluctant to release it, preferring instead Going Back, written by Jerry Goffin and Carole King. Mr. Crosby vigorously argued against using outside writers for a band that already had three, and tension in the band grew. There was anger too over political speeches he'd made between songs when the band played the Monterey Pop Festival the summer before. All of it led to his firing. Mr. McGuean and Mr. Hillman delivered the crushing news. They said, I was impossible to work with, and I wasn't very good anyway, and they'd do better without me, Mr. Crosby told the British music magazine Uncut. It hurt like hell. I didn't try to reason with them. I just said, it's a shameful waste. Goodbye. By this time, Mr. Crosby had already started casually jamming with Mr. Stills, the guitarist and singer whose group Buffalo Springfield had recently disbanded. Mr. Crosby wrote his first song with Mr. Stills along with Paul Kantner of Jefferson Airplane while sailing on a 74-foot boat he had acquired a year earlier. The song, Witten Ships, also recorded by the airplane, tested out the vocal blend that would become Crosby, Stills, and Nash's signature. Mr. Crosby and Mr. Stills connected with Mr. Nash in July 1968 at a party at Joni Mitchell's house in the Laurel Canyon section of Los Angeles. Mr. Nash was eager to leave his slick British pop act, The Hollies, to join the hot folk rock scene. The three began meeting on their own to perfect their sound, and when Ahmed Ertegen, president of Atlantic Records, heard their elegant three-way vocal braiding, he signed them to his label. A Grammy, then a death. The group's debut album titled simply Crosby, Stills & Nash was released in May 1969 and shot into the top 10. It earned them a Grammy as Best New Artist. 
Beside Wooden Ships, the album included two other songs by Mr. Crosby, The Shimmering Guinevere, and the elegiac Long Time Gone, which he wrote after the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy in 1968. Legendary singer-songwriter David Crosby, last word before he died. Life is for the living. Death is for the dead. My life be like my music. I go to seek a great perhaps.